The following is a dead bug documentary. If you're watching it anywhere else than my channel, then some thieving fuck stole it. It were on a chilly Sunday night, June 5th, 1960, when two 18-year-old teenage boys took their young, pretty girlfriends into the forest on the shore of Lake Bowden. The young girls had told the parents that they were staying at each other's house. They brought along a bottle of homemade loca, a strong home-brewed alcohol that one of the girls had stolen from a parent's basement. They also had a small tent they planned to do some fishing, but the fish weren't biting, which were quite upsetting. But I guess soon, that wouldn't matter. Between 4.30 and 6 in the morning, someone approached the teen's tent and went on a slice and dice mission, carving them up as they slept. And if police reports were to be believed, it were messy, like four spastics eating spaghetti together on a roller coaster. Stabbing and bludgeoning three of them to death right through the tent. And they didn't have a goddamn chance. Lying there in their underwear, just been given a one-way ticket to the abyss. A couple of fishermen say that they saw a man in his late 30s, early 40s, rushing from the area. It were a carpenter, out jogging, who discovered the bodies at about 11 a.m. He then phoned the cops and told them about finding three dead teens in a tent. But one of the teens, who was still alive, were fully clothed and lying outside of the tent. Nalves Gustafson seemed to be one lucky guy, cause even his wounds were superficial. But me, I don't believe in luck. But when police found his shoes half a mile away, covered in blood, they started thinking it were more than just luck. And when they started poking around, they discovered recently that the two teenage boys hadn't been such good amigos and that there'd been rumors of a love triangle, which gave the cops a motive. Now they just had to find a weapon. But it seems Niles weren't giving much away, because when police questioned him, he were as cool as a cucumber. A Finnish cucumber. When the papers came out, I guess everyone in Finland were wondering why the killer, the killers, didn't finish off young Niles. Cause it ain't as if he was special. Oh, was he? With all Finnish fingers pointing at the miraculous survivor, it were a photograph taken at the funeral of his dead friends. The police noticed the face of a stranger, who bore a startling resemblance to the man seen running from the death tent. When cops did a little poking around, they found out the man at the funeral were Hans Assman. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. 
And although Iceman had a reputation for being a dick, and he hated teenagers, and lived only three miles away from the crime, he were as clean as a cripple's boot, cause he had an airtight alibi. His wife said that he were at home with her in bed. It was then that the case went cold. But Finnish cops weren't gonna let lack of evidence and time finish off their investigation. It was when a retired detective, who still had a hard on for the kid with the spiky hair, came forward with DNA evidence and a theory that got the ball rolling. He had discovered that all three dead teens' blood were on Gustafson's shoes, but not his own, because the detectives believed that after a heavy night of drinking, Niles caught his best friend and his girlfriend getting busy. Then, he started a fight with his best friend, explaining how Niles got the black eye. After his bigger friend kicked his ass, Niles went out and got a knife used to clean the fish and a hammer to build the tent, and he killed his best friend, then his cheating whore girlfriend. The other girl, she was collateral damage. And then, he got the fuck out of there. Then about 15 minutes into his marathon, he saw the Shirez on his shoes, so he took him off, threw him away, and ran back, stabbed himself, then laid there barefoot waiting for someone to find his sorry ass soul. And that was the theory that the cops had back in 1960, they just didn't have the technology to prove it. Fast forward to the future. And poor Niles, he didn't even realize he were a suspect. When arrested, he told police, what's done is done. I'll get 15 years, and then I'll be out. But he later denied this confession, and said the police were lying. The once handsome teen, now a middle-aged man, told the press that he believed there were a shopkeeper in the area who had hated teenagers and that they had a run-in with him earlier that day and he'd take revenge on them that night. But cops didn't need to look for anybody else because they had who they believed were their man. The pieces of the puzzle fell in place like a spastic's Velcro shoes. But now they needed Niles Gustafson to answer some questions. Why was it that his girlfriend had been stabbed more than anybody else? Fifteen times, and half of those in her face, and her panties were around their ankles, and she would drip and cum. They believed the semen in his girlfriend was his best friend's, and that he'd been suspicious about his best friend for some time, and that something didn't taste right. And when he finally caught them together, it was his turn to take care of business. And what he did were a crime of passion. But Niles Gustafson weren't taking the prosecutor's bait, and he just sat there twiddling his thumbs. But those weren't the only unanswered questions. How was it that Niles expected us to believe that the killer stole his shoes, then abandoned them half a mile away? He must have thought the prosecution and the police were a bunch of mentals. Or maybe he was just thinking of something quick because he could see the cops coming through the bushes as he stabbed himself twice in the leg. During the trial, Niles' mother spoke on his behalf. She said her son wouldn't even hurt a puppy dog. But in the end, I don't think this were about a puppy. They were about pussy and betrayal. But most importantly, it were about payback. <laughs> <laughs>